um, two legends um, and a club that means so much to the both of you. Yeah, absolutely. We, we know Gifton and I have spoken many times in the past of what we both feel about the football club and, and delighted to be involved with the new show. Yeah, you know, like myself, always willing to do stuff when it comes to the club, you know, talk about the club, be around the club. As I've said to many people and everyone who knows me knows how I feel about Watford and how dear they are to my heart. So to be part of the, the first show in this is really great for me. No, massively. And now, guys have both got some great stats as well. So let's take a little look through some of the stats. Gifton, we're going to start with you uh, and your career, uh, not just at Watford, but first of all, starting things off, of course, with Watford. But you had a, you had a great career, very much enjoyed, played some, some good clubs, obviously none as good as Watford. You started at the top, but, you know, <laughs> some good memories for you in your 356 appearances. Yeah, it was a... It was a you, they haven't put down my Spanish clubs in there, but I, I, I won't take that personally. Um, <laughs> but um, it, was a short, it was a short career because of Jeff Rice. I retired early. But yeah, I played for some good clubs and had good experience in my, in my career, so mm. thank God for that. No, massively. We can uh, have a little look at your stats as well from your, your time here at Watford as well. Um, 127 games, 40 goals as well. A prolific goal scorer for the club. Got some good memories and some good goals here at Vicarage Road. Oh, you know, as I said before, my best times at Watford before my injury. Um, the goals were, were exciting, playing with Tom and just playing at Vicarage Road was exciting. You know, scoring every, my first ever, ever professional goal was at Vicarage Road, so... You know, Vicky's role, and if I got it there, it means a lot to me. I can beat you. Tommy, let's take your stats. We can just about squeeze the amount of clubs onto one page of the graphic. So uh, apologies if you've got to get a bit close to the screen to read all these clubs. Uh, but Tommy, uh, some good memories of some of those clubs you played for. We haven't got long, so maybe pick one or two. <laughs> I can see where the way that this show's <laughs> going to go <laughs> already. You haven't got my Spanish club on there as well, so don't feel left out, no. gifted. All right. <laughs> yeah, there is. I did play for a long time. I'd played a lot of games, so you have to keep moving around. It's not like somebody was chasing me. You just have to keep moving <laughs> around. <clubs. laughs> yeah, I like to stay fresh. Yeah. And so we'll look at your Watford stats as well, because again, another prolific goal scorer for the club as well. You know, 65 goals in 259 appearances. Yeah, I, I played in almost every position by a goalkeeper, I think, during the, the, the Graham Taylor years. So, yeah, I had a, obviously had a fabulous time. I, I always like to get in that I played at centre-back for two years because that makes my scoring stats look better when I was playing at <laughs> centre-back. more favourable. <laughs> yeah. I, I love that. Let's, that uh... They forget that you should play centre-back and, and left wing-back and left centre-back and all the other positions on the, on the pitch as well. As Wherever I was told I played, you know yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's talk debuts as well, um, because you've got this in common, that you both made your debut against the same club and at the same ground as well. So, uh, Gifton, we're going to start for you. You made your debut 96 under Kenny Jacket. Um, yeah. It was a, a defeat, unfortunately, on the road away at Sunderland. But your memories of this game coming off the bench for uh, Wayne Andrews? Yeah, it was a great opportunity for me, being a 16-year-old kid and just going there for the journey, really. That's what I was going there for, just for the experience. And then a couple of people got sick and before I knew it, I was on the bench and before I knew I was on the pitch, so it was, a, it was a great time for me. It kind of just went without me even thinking about it, to be honest. The game was going on and I got thrown on and it was a, a great time to play at Roker Park. It was such a loud atmosphere and a great atmosphere, so it was great to do it and my, my debut there. Amazing. Now, uh, two years earlier, 1994, under Glenn Roder, he wanted Tommy Mooney in his side. Let's look at your uh, game, also away at Sunderland. It's a defeat for both of you, so at least things could only get better after your first game for both of you. Um, Tommy, looks like you started that game, of course, um, and one of your favourite kits, if I remember rightly, from a previous conversation. That is my first Watford kit, yeah. And, it, and that's actually proof to, to the kids that I did have a fringe once, <laughs> <laughs> a long time ago. No, it's, I, I remember it well. I, I think I only trained on the Thursday and then we, we obviously went up to, and stayed in the hotel on the Friday at Sunderland. So it happened really quick. There was three or four players came in the same week. Um, and obviously forever grateful to, to come to the club. No, massively. Uh, now, of course, uh, you can see behind us on our studio here, uh, we've got a lovely backdrop. The one and only Mr. Graham Taylor, a guy that you both played under, um, an incredibly special guy and some great memories for, for you two of the, the, the legend that is. Yeah, absolutely. Just as everybody does, everybody has a, a, a GT story or gaffer, as we would call him. Um, everybody has that story and, and, and everybody smiles when you relate to him and talk about him. So he was just a, a, a fabulous man that enhanced and, and, and pushed our careers for both of us. But certainly for, for me, I saw my first professional contract with him at Aston Villa and then when he came into Watford, it, it, things just got even better. Yeah, for me... The gaffer was just a, a great man. He was someone who I could, we could sit down and do the whole show just on him and, and I could talk about for another hour 
about what he done for me in my career personally. Um, I've got so many different stories about him and he was a great person both on the pitch and off the pitch. His knowledge of the game was second to none. Um, I hear many people talking about football and things about football and they're bringing it up as a new science and like it's brand new. And when I tell people, but Graham Taylor told me that back in 1996. <laughs> and we, but we knew that in 1996, he didn't have all these special graphics, but he broke the game down to us. So he was someone that, when I look back now at my football career, I think, wow, what a teaching I had and what upbringing I had been with Kenny, being with Luther, being especially with Graham Taylor. Um, I, I had the best upbringing possible. He was very philosophical about the game. And, you know, a lot said these days about stats. We were using stats long before they were famous and long before they were available. Yep. Literally, the, the gaffer would have somebody, if not himself, to check the results. He'd watch videos Every of games, game. make up the stats uh, himself. So y you knew how um, fastidious he was on the, on the training pitch. And he used to say that attention to de detail is why you're a professional. And I think that rubs off. You won't get any player that, that played for the gaffer that haven't used some of his methods later in their career as a player, as a coach, in recruitment. There's there's many many things that rub off from, from GT, and you know I know the supporters feel exactly the same way as we do about him. We just seen some lovely pictures there of him on the training pitch. What, what was he like at training? That was him. You know, if I'll be honest with you, the actual sessions. The best Kenny was the, was a really good coach. Kenny is a very good coach. And Kenny would keep us going on the sessions wise. So he, the gaffer wouldn't really be on the training ground very often. So at the beginning of the week, he'd come out, make sure we're, we're doing all right. So the session is the right tempo. He'll go back in. If things weren't right, he'll step in and say something. But in general, Kenny really kept us going. But on the days, Thursday, Fridays, later on in the week, when it was tactical days, and he came out and he's just, he's a, as Tommy said, his attention to detail, he would tell us what's going to happen, how it's going to happen. And if we'd done what he said, that's exactly what would happen. He knew weaknesses of other teams. He knew how we'd score goals. He would just say so simple, Gifton, when the ball is in this area of the pitch, you get in there and you score for a one-touch finish. And it sounds really simple. Like That's all he said. That's genuinely all he said. When the ball's here or there, you get in the box there and then you'll score for a one-touch finish. He used to walk around, walk around the training <laughs> pitch. You'd have an, an 11 v 11 or even just to start an 11 and he'd walk around with the football in his hand. And he'd just walk around the pitch and the players had to move to where the ball was on the pitch. Yeah. And that sounds incredibly basic. Yes. It's probably how FIFA, the game, started. Yeah. <laughs> but that was the gaffer. You knew yeah. you would do it. And we would do it every Tuesday, yeah. every Thursday, yeah. just for five or ten minutes. And then you'd, you'd have a meeting about having another meeting having meet later on that, that day. <laughs> <laughs> if we were paid by the meeting, we'd be yes. millionaires. Yeah. But it was attention to detail, as I said, and that's why we, we got those promotions. That's why we've done so well, because we knew everything was going on. We all knew each other's jobs, so no one could ever do something wrong. If I was at a, at a position, someone else would tell me. If someone else was happening, they would tell me. So it was that kind of cohesiveness that we had, and it brought us into be a family, didn't it? We had, it made us a family, even though all of us was of different age groups, different backgrounds, and maybe we didn't all get on off the pitch but we had something in common once we stepped over that white line we all got on. I think that was the key to his recruitment. Mm. Uh, and I, I know because I've had the conversation with him, he'd, he'd say that the, the personality is more important than the footballer because he had to, to bring the ingredients into a dressing room. Because you, as a footballer, you, you're together with your teammates yeah. but some, for, for long periods of the, of the year, yeah. more than you see your family. <laughs> so it, it's incredibly important that you have... You, it's, it's normal for a, for a dressing room there to be ructions. Yeah. We rowed like cats and dogs, Gifton <laughs> and I. Did, really did. <laughs> but I should yeah. be sat in the middle then, shouldn't they I? Yeah, yeah. But there's been plenty of people in the middle yeah, of me I've been <laughs> many, many times, yeah. don't worry. Yeah. But then come the first whistle on a, on a match day, That's it. we know exactly what, I knew all, what I was going to get from him and he knew what he'd get from me. Yeah. Mm. And um, we all had that, that same goal and that's why we were successful as a group, weren't we? Because all that, that one common goal that we want to win on Saturday. And sometimes, as, as Tommy said, sometimes we'll get erupts in little situations in training because we just want to win. I want to win, he wants to win, this one wants to win, that one wants to win. And if that's not going right in training, sometimes you do lose your head at times. But we was all very, Plus very Plus, you close. were after my shirt. <laughs> well, I had it. I had you on the back. That's why we're saying about it. I love that. That's awesome. Look, th thank you so much for sharing that. And look, it's great to have you know, the manager as part of our, our set here in the studio because he's always in our hearts here. 
at the club. And of course, that's what this show is going to be all about, getting inside the hive, not just talking about football uh, all the time. We're going to talk about those other little stories as well. So it's going to be something really special that's going to be part of the show. Uh, right, we're going to talk a bit more in depth about the club in general now. Now, you're both ambassadors for the club, which is incredible. Um, and I know, Tommy, first of all, for you and Gifton, you got involved in well as well during, during the COVID lockdown. You guys played a massive part in being part of this community as well. And that's something that you're both incredibly proud of. Yeah, I think... It there's several initiatives that the, the club carried out through COVID and still going on mm. um, are, are, are exceptional. And, and I know from the amount of supporters that I've spoken to and other players have spoken to, it's appreciated, both sides of it. It's not just appreciated by the supporters. They made me smile and lifted me <laughs> as much as, as hopefully I did for them. They probably don't know that until now, but I can assure you every player felt exactly the same because we all like talking about nice memories. Yeah most of it with with gt from my era so you know what you expected to be a five minute co phone call and i think my re record was about 58 minutes so <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if, how many were beating it but yeah i, I just think it, it's that's what you expect of watford we're a family club a community club and and that's no more than you'd expect yeah i can just 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 add on to what tommy just said there for me it was wonderful as a footballer i don't think you realize the power you have and the impact you have on other people's lives because you're just going about your day, you're playing, you go from one club to another club, and you're just having your career. But being retired now and f making those phone calls, and I'm calling someone who maybe, whatever their situation may be, but someone who needs a phone call, and you're phoning them, and they would make me happy. <laughs> but I would leave the phone call and they've cheered me up, if that makes <laughs> sense, and I'm meant to be phoning them to cheer them up. And it was, they would talk about, as Tommy said, memories, games, goals I scored, things that I've even forgot about. They would remember it, and they would bring it up, and. You know, it brings a smile to my face and actually made me happy. And it made me that, wow, what impact we actually have, still have, even as ex-professional footballers, when it comes to Watford and, and this club, there's still a lot of impact that we can have. So I love making the phone calls and I think what the club were doing was and still are doing is a, is a great thing. Once we'd convinced them that it actually is us on the phone yeah. and, not, and not being <laughs> Sorry, who? pranked by Sorry, one who? of their mates. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. I, actually, I actually got one, one guy who I did speak to later on and we, we did laugh about it. He asked me if I could call him back. He was, he was a little bit busy in the kitchen. He said, not a problem, that's fine. That. <laughs> some, uh, some great initiatives and of course uh, the club is always there for you as fans. So if you need anything, do get in touch and if you want 53 minutes on the phone with Tommy and it won't send you to sleep too much, I'm sure we can arrange that for you as well. Um, Part of this show as well, we're going to look at all aspects of the club, not just the men's first team. Of course, we've got a fantastic women's set up here at the club and the academy as well. And that's going to be a massive part of the show. And that's pretty much what a Premier League club today is. It's more than just that men's first team on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon or Friday or Monday, whatever day of the week we play. But, but Tommy, it's important that the club has that depth. And we're very lucky here at Watford that we've got that. Yeah, I think it's, it's about taking, taking the, the badge, the club, the family, to, to all areas of, of the, the close surrounding areas and further afield worldwide. You know, it's about taking, it's almost, it, it sounds a little bit harsh to call it a brand, but the, the family is becoming a brand and the Premier League is, is, is part of, of the interest of the world. Yeah. And being back in the Premier League, it's great to, to, um, to take Watford to the rest of the world. Yeah. And also I feel women's football is really coming to a whole other level. And if you look at all the, the big teams, they all have women's football going on. And I think Watford, if we want to be a sustainable Premiership club, we need to be showing that we are fully inclusive and fully diverse. He's all around, you know. We've got young kids, we've got the, the first team, and also we've got all the stuff that the trust do as well, um, with all of the different um, different types of, of, of groups. But also we've got a women's team who, who could do well. I know that this season is hard for them, it's their first season in the Championship, but I feel with the right backing and the right people behind them, that they can actually do something and, and be a good team in this league. No, 100%. And we're going to be talking more about the women's team uh, very shortly. But first of all, let's talk about the academy and the 23s so far. We can take a look at their results so far this season. Bit of a mixed bag, but when they've won, they've won well. A great result against Sheffield Wednesday. A 4-1 victory over Crew Alexandra. A win over Newcastle United in the Premier League Cup. And a big 3-1 victory over Hull as well. It's great to see the under-23s doing really well. And of course, academy football uh, is a big part of everything we do here at the club as well. And I want to talk about your academy journeys and your early early careers as footballers because I know like you're both involved with with helping younger players develop now and I know Gifton you do quite a bit of coaching as well at the moment um just to compare then and now really for you guys as Gifton your early career and academy football what, what kind of support was there for you and what was your journey like yeah first of all I just want to talk about those results I just saw um yeah 
just just very quickly. Um, people might see the results and they might think, oh, they've lost a lot of games. But what people have to understand is the 23s this year is a very young team. Um, Omar, Reza and, and Richard Shaw, they're really doing some good things this year. And they're trying to embed those youngsters and give them a fresh start. So some of them are finding it a bit hard at the moment. And the results, as you can see, are not results that you have of a winning team. But the experience that these young kids are getting, I think, for the years coming, will hold them in, in, in really, really great stead. Um, yeah, so I went off topic. No, no, not yeah. at all. No, this is what the show's about. It's, it's, and it's good to get that insight because I think yeah. it's one of those things, it's very easy, isn't it? You know, as a fan of a club, just to, to look at that first team. But actually, that academy is something we should be really proud of. And, you know, yeah. over the coming weeks, you know, we're going to be speaking to some of the players on the show and, and getting them involved as well. So, um, yeah, it's a real yeah. important part. But just to answer your question, uh, for me personally, the Watford Academy was massive for me. You know, um, I joined when I was 12 years old. <clears throat> um, and the, the teaching I learned, the things I learned at Watford, it, it, it taught me the game, it taught me the game craft, it taught me how to be a footballer, it taught me how to be professional. So I think that's very important in a young, in a young player's life. I think these days they start a bit young, um, starting seven, eight years old. Um, everyone's got their different opinions. I personally think it's a bit too young myself, but um, I think that once the kids get in at a good age in the academy, then I think the academy system is a, is, is a great system to be part of. I think having Richard Johnson in there at the moment and um, Jimmy Gilligan is a great for change. I think that over the years coming, I think fans should really be excited because I know there's going to be youngsters coming through the team with, with those people at the head of the academy. Mm. My, uh, my experience of, uh, of coming through is, is very, very different. In fact, the opposite to Gifton's because you know, I, I was released as a schoolboy at my hometown club. So I started playing men's Saturday afternoon football as a 16-year-old and then went back to Aston Villa later on to be, become a scholar and then turn pro and then moved to make my league, league debut. So it was mm. very, very different to, to, to Gifton's. And that's why we all love football, because everybody's story is different. Mm. Whether you, you go through the turnstiles, whether you're a player that's signed to a club, or a manager or a coach, you know, and, and Gifton talks about the academy now. I think it's, it's starting from a level now that Jimmy and, and, and Richard are, are, are trying to turn things around with that academy and, and make, bring it back to how it used to be with the likes of Gifton and Richard Johnson, Robert Page, Paul yeah. Robinson, all of those players coming through, um, the, it wasn't an academy then, but through the youth team system. Yeah. And I think it's, it's also important to realise, we look at the results, but the under, 20, under 21s or 23s, whichever it may be, and the under 18s, it's not a result, results business. No. It's about bringing players through. And we all have that different route to, to becoming a footballer. Mm -hmm. Some sadly fall by the wayside, but academies have a, also have a job to, to make them good individuals and young men who know how to, to behave in, in certain situations. It's not just about, you know, you don't throw them away because they're not good enough to play for you. Mm -hmm. I wasn't good enough to play for Aston Villa, but I, I was good enough to play for Watford a little bit year, later on. And without that, that schooling mm -hmm. at Aston Villa, I may not have got here. I'm, I wouldn't journey, have been sat, yeah. sat here. We all have a different journey. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really important to, to think when you're talking about um, academy football. And I've coached in it, I've, I've recruited in it, and I've managed the, the long players at Aston Villa while still working with the strikers. So I, I, I've seen many, many players come through. I've seen some sadly fall away, but they'll go into non-league and they'll come back if they're good enough because that's what the game's like. If, you, if you're good enough and you want it enough, mm -hmm. if you're stubborn enough like I was, that there was nothing else I wanted to do, even though I was almost a trained accountant when I was offered the chance to come back. <laughs> the two were very, very yeah, different yeah, things. Yeah. But I wanted to be a footballer enough to come back into it. And some players that, that go out of academy football will be good enough later on yep. if they keep giving it everything that they've got. Or mm. to a GT reference, give of your best. Give if you best. give of your best every day, then you'll get what you deserve. Mm. And obviously hindsight's a wonderful thing and, and I'm a, a big believer you shouldn't change the past because, you know, that's what's got you to where you got to. But obviously you, your experience being different, you know, if someone offered you the opportunity of the academy system as it is now, would you have would jump to that? Or do you think actually your journey made you the player you were? No, I think it did. I was incredibly lucky to, to achieve and, and experience everything I did. I wouldn't change. And I, a lot of players will say it and don't mean it. I mean it. I wouldn't change a thing about my career. Mm. I think you, sometimes you look back and you think, I could have done that differently or I could have gone to that club or mm -hmm. that club, which is normally yeah. the thing that yeah. ex-players we think, you know, should I, I, I should have maybe gone to Everton instead of Birmingham, but I got another medal at Birmingham and I played in the championship. You know, it's one, it's one of those people always ask you those questions. I genuinely wouldn't change a thing. Mm -hmm. I, feel, I feel extremely lucky.
Mm. Right. Massively. And of course, it's uh, incredibly special as well when you see those players from the academy then come into the first team as well. It's something that we all love to see. Now, a team that we have really enjoyed watching here at Vicarage Road has, of course, been the women's team. And a little bit earlier on, I caught up with Helen Ward. So uh, have a look at this. Helen, thank you so much for joining us uh, inside the Hive. Um, this weekend, big game against Palace here at Vicarage Road. What's it been like for you guys playing here? Because it's been awesome to see the amount of games that we're getting here for the women's team. Yeah, it's fantastic. You know, me personally as a Watford fan, it makes it all the more special. Um, hopefully we can get loads of people in on, on the weekend to come and support us. And yeah, the, the surface out there is incredible. You know, it's one of the best pitches in the country, let alone in the women's game. Um, so for us to be out there and, and playing on it, you know, for so many home games is, is great for us. And the only trouble is the opposition like coming here too. So we have to try and make it a bit more of a fortress and use it to our advantage. But no, no complaints from us. It's, it's fantastic and it, you know, shows how much of a part of the club we are. No, completely. And I guess it's really great as well, isn't it, for like those younger fans in the stand, you know, for, for decades we've had like young boys in the fa in the crowd be able to see their idols play on the pitch and now they can see their, their women's idols playing on the pitch as well, which inspires an, another entire different generation of young girls. It does. And I mean, I actually, I've got a, a little girl who, who's been a fan of ours for, for a long time and I spoke to her mum, I think it was after we played Liverpool here and she said that, that Isla had said, Oh, that's going to be me one day and that's the first time really they've been like you said that that they've been able to say that and and see their themselves there in you know however many years in in the future and you know hopefully i'll be sat in the stands watching her play here one day and it will be something that's you know completely normal no, it certainly will um let's talk about life in the championship obviously it's been a difficult start um, how are you finding it yeah as you said it's been uh it's been a rough start we've played some of the the top teams from last season so it was always going to be difficult um but, you know, we're, we're finding our feet. Our performances are getting there, even if the results aren't, aren't showing that at the moment. Um, but we've, we've got a very together group. We're, we're going to stick to, to what we know and what we, what we do best. Um, Clint's got a lot of faith in us and, and I have a lot of faith in us as well. So I've no doubt that those results will start coming. As I said, the performances are getting there and that's the most important thing for us, that we're not going to lose hope. And, yeah, I'm certainly hoping that we can go on a little run, hopefully before Christmas pick up some points and build some momentum going into the new year. Obviously, we're very blessed to have a player like yourself with a, an incredible international pedigree. We've also got um, Emma Beckett in there as well. Um, how useful have you found that with the younger players being able to learn off you and the advice you're being able to give? Yeah, hopefully they find it helpful. I think, you know, Emma's got international experience herself and there's, there's a couple of others in there that have got fantastic experience at this level and higher. Um, Anna Maywald, Megan Chandler to name a couple um, and I think the younger players and some of the girls that haven't played at this level before hopefully they they feel they're able to lean on us for that experience um, but yeah that you know they're, they're pushing us as much as we're pushing them they're a talented group of girls um, and I've, I've no doubt they are ready for it although as I said the results haven't necessarily shown that so far we've seen glimpses from every player in the squad that they're more than ready for the challenge and you know it's exciting to to be working with them. Obviously, being part of the club is incredibly special as well. Um, how have you found the support from the club with the training? And we've obviously mentioned about playing here at Vicarage Road, but, you know, really feeling part of this Watford family. Yeah, it means the world. I mean, I was at Watford as a, as a youngster and the change in the women's team and, and how we're integrated in the club is, is unbelievable. And for the last two or three years since I've been here, um, it's only gone from strength to strength. We've got some real good allies within the men's club, Richard Walker, to name, to name just one. Um, who really backs us and is in our corner. Um, but it feels like we don't really need that anymore. We are just part of the club and, it, and it's accepted now. Train at the training ground, we're playing games here and we're getting as much support as we can from the club. And, you know, that goes a long way, um, both on and off the pitch. So hopefully that, that bond and, and that relationship can just keep growing um, and it'll be like that for, forevermore. Yeah, no, completely. Of course, we've uh, got the draw for the Women's European Championship um, today as well. Of course, that's going to be played in the United Kingdom next year. Um, it's amazing seeing how much the women's game's growing, isn't it? The exposure it's getting on TV and the support that just seems to grow week by week. Yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, obviously, I'm disappointed that I'm not there myself with Wales. Um, but it would be great to see such a big tournament on you know, home soil, if you like. And I think it's going to only do big things for the game. It's only going to raise the profile to see the world's best players or the Europe, Europe's best players, sorry, come in, come into town. And, you know, we see a lot of them week in, week out in, in the WSL. And, but to see them with their international teams and, and all the stars coming over, I think will be fantastic. And 
like you said, each week it's going from strength to strength and, and I think that'll only enhance it and hopefully we'll see more and more of it in the future. Yeah, we certainly will. Um, and just finally, obviously you've got this game, Crystal Palace at the weekend. One you're looking forward to? Yeah, definitely. We look forward to every game. Um, we've had a good couple of weeks training. I've, I've obviously missed it. I've been away with Wales, but I've been told that the girls have been working hard and getting to grips with the game plan for this weekend. So hopefully we can see a lot of fans there to cheer us on in their Halloween costumes um, and spur us on to three points. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us uh, from inside the hive tonight. Um, we're going to let you go off training now. But best <laughs> of luck for the weekend and we'll see you on Sunday. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. There we go. Great to hear from Helen ahead of their game here at Vicarage Road on Sunday. Um, and Tommy, you know, Helen touched on it there. It's fantastic that the women are getting the opportunity to play at Vicarage Road and make this their home as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, was, I was lucky enough to see uh, the game against Charlton. Um, not, not the greatest result, but certainly just to see them at, at Vicarage Road and the supporters coming into the Graham Taylor stand and watching the game. I think it's it, essentially whether it's the, the, the women's team or the men's team or the academy team. You, you're wearing the same badge, so you come and support the club, whoever's wearing that badge on whatever day it is. So I think it's it's great that the, now the women's team is, is certainly getting the, the, the exposure they deserve. Mm. And Gifton, you're going to get involved with the women's team, doing some coaching as well. I think you've done one or two sessions already. Um, how, how's it going? Yeah, I've done a session on Tuesday with them. Um, enjoyed it, really, really enjoyed it. Um, I love women's football. I love football in general, like women's football, youth football adults, whoever, whoever football is, so just just being with the, the women, the, 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 the energy, the environment was really good. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting my teeth into a bit more of coaching sessions and doing a bit more of them. Because mm, obviously it's a massive learning curve this season. We said you know, results may be, be disappointing, but actually this is a big step up for the club. They've got some great experience in that side as well. Um, from your perspective, from, from a coaching style, how does the women's game adapt from the youth coaching and the men's coaching you've done? I guess every different level of football is a different style of coaching. Yeah, you know, football, football is football overall. But obviously when you're in more of a first team environment, maybe the way you treat your, your players in, in the men's game and you talk to them and the detail you give them is a little bit different to what you give the female players. The female players love a lot of detail. They love a lot of detail and they ask a lot of questions, which I love because as a coach, any, any detail you give them has to be on point. And I really like that. So with, with a lot of boys and young men, they just want to go and play. So even if you give them the detail, they'll sometimes ignore a lot of it and they just go and play and do their own thing. Where in the female game, they're, they're more receptive to, to information and, and want to follow those, those, those little nuggets that you're giving them. So I, I enjoy it and I really love it, yeah. And how much of a step is it? Obviously, the team did really well to get promotion into the championship um, and obviously the next step, hopefully WSL. But it is a big jump, isn't it, from what, the level they were playing last year to where they are this year? Oh, it's a massive jump. And um, people have to understand it's a massive jump. You've got teams that have been in this league for a good few years. That they know the league. You've got players who are well established in this league. Um, but Watford have some good players. They have some good individuals. They've got some good youngsters that are coming through as well. I was quite impressed with some, a few, three or four of the young players in the dev squad that came and trained with the first team. And I was really impressed with them. So I think that as long as you can gain enough points to make sure that this year, this year they survive in the league, I think the years to come, I think that the, it's, it's really looking positive for Watford. Massive. We're very lucky, obviously, we mentioned in there, obviously, we've got Emma and we've got, got Helen there. We can look at Helen's stats, actually, because obviously a fantastic international player as well for Wales. You know, she's got some great stats on that. 96 appearance, 44 get goals for Wales, 152 uh, appearances and 142 goals. Tommy, you'd love her. A goals per game ratio like that. It's an incredible stat, isn't it? Whether that's women's football, men's football, it's it's almost irrelevant with that stat there for, for Helen. And I watched it. She's, she was outstanding a couple of weeks ago. But those stats, I mean, in the men's game, she'd be worth 500 million, wouldn't she, with, yes. those, with those stats? And you hear her speak. She, she's, like Gifton's just said, she loves the game of football and loves playing it. She's just got to keep as, as fit as she can now and... and not improve those stats because they're almost it's unimprovable, amazing. aren't they? It's but amazing. They're, they keep them going because they're, they're, they're fabulous. They certainly are. And if you're uh, watching this on a scouting mission, go away. She's one of our players. <laughs> uh, and of course, we want to see you here this weekend. We've got a big weekend. And of course, Sunday, uh, the women's team are going to be playing against Crystal Palace. It's a 2 p.m. kickoff. We'd love to see you here for that in the FA Women's Championship. You can get tickets for that one by going to tickets.watfordfc. 2pm kickoff here at Vicarage Road. We'd love for you to come along and give your support to the women's team who are playing here on Sunday. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you watching on YouTube tonight. Thank you so much. Pleasure to have you along for our first ever show here of Inside the Hive. And you've uh, popped some comments and questions into the comment box below. So thank you for those. So I'm going to fire these at uh, Tommy and Gifton right now. Um, 
Paul Burns, thank you very much for your question. Paul says, how did you both feel when Graham Taylor managed England and was so lambasted? Uh-huh. Well, you've got to remember that <clears throat> the gaffer you, was... You weren't born then, gifted just to me. Yes, so <laughs> the gaffer was England manager before he came to us. So you've got to understand an ex-England manager is going to become your manager. And I'm a 17-year-old young man. So and I, Plus I knew Graham, the gaffer from when I was 16. So... For me, he was always a legend. You're, he's someone who I always follow and I learn from. Um, you know, you've seen so many things in the newspapers and bad, bad things that they were said about him and they've they done to him. But as a young person, you see that about a lot of people. So for me, it was about seeing who this guy is. And the, 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 the gaffer is the gaffer, you know, the, the, how he saved me when I was a 16-year-old um, by not releasing me, by looking after me. It just always, it was always someone special for me personally. So whatever happened before, being England manager, I didn't really didn't really pay no toll in, in, in my life, really. Yeah, I suppose it, it, was, it, it was difficult for me to watch because, ironically, the, the year that I left Aston Villa was the year that, that the gaffer took the England job in, in 1990. So um, just after the tournament where David Platt, who was his captain at Aston Villa, and I was his boot boy at, uh, at Villa. So there's, there's a lot of similarities and connections. So it was difficult because as much as he'd released me at Aston Villa, I still had... You know, th- there was no animosity. He just didn't think that I would play at that level. And he was honest with me. And his honesty on that day when he released me made me feel better and want to be a footballer even more. So, you know, years later, after he'd had the England job and then gone back to other clubs, he comes here. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, the, to, to success, as simple as that, when he came in. Mm. Amazing. Uh, right, next question comes from Ruddy Johnson. Ruddy, thank you very much for your question. Um, who inspired you to become a professional footballer? Me, um, it was a couple of things. Well, I was five years old. My cousin bought my cousin Michael. Um, he bought me an Arsenal shirt, and yeah, he bought me an Arsenal shirt. And that Christmas, I had put the Arsenal shirt, and I shouted in front of everyone, "I'm going to be a professional footballer." And everyone kind of be quiet, gift and go and play with your toys, kind of thing. <laughs> and I was five years old, and I kind of made my mind at that, that point that I was going to be a footballer. But getting a few years going on, Ian Wright, Andy Cole. They were just, I've got my gold tooth because of Ian, right? Um, yeah, that's how much of an idol he was for me. So Ian Ryan and, and Andrew Cole, they were the two people that I really looked up to and I just wanted to be like them. I think for me, I grew up in the, the northeast of England. It was a hotbed for football. So, you know, my dad was and still is a massive Liverpool fan. So I grew up watching Liverpool and Kenny Daglish was, was my hero. But also my dad had been involved through football while I was, I was a kid, so... Obviously, I was I, I was going to follow in his footsteps. Yeah, awesome. Uh, next question comes from Balraj Thakur. Thank you very much for your question. Um, how can we keep hold of the best players from the academy, and what what do we class as a su- successful academy? I guess I'll go straight to you on that one, Gifton. Uh, what I personally I class as a successful academy is that when the players that have come through your your system, when they're at thirty years old, apart from injuries and apart from things that are out of their control they're still playing football. That for me is a, is a successful academy because I don't think that every player that comes through Watford Academy will play for Watford. Or like what Tommy just said, will be good enough to play for Watford. Watford now is a Premier League club, so not every club that you develop, is, every kid you develop is going to be good enough to play in the, prim, in the first team. But I believe that if we are a Premiership club and we're developing young, young men, I believe that they should be good enough to filter down. So whether that's down to a championship side, whether it's down to a League One side, whether it's down to League Two, even if you want to go into a non-league system and you go non-league semi-professional football, I believe that every child that comes through, apart from the obvious, should be playing football at the age of 30 or around that age. I think if you're doing that, then it's a successful academy. Obviously, selling players, obviously having players play for the first team is successful as well. But I I look at it more than that because I feel there's a small percentage that will play in the first team and a wider percentage won't play in the first team. So if you've got an academy, what are you doing for the wider percentage as well as the small percentage? That's, that's my little... Um... Yeah, I think it's, it's important not, not to judge it by a, a player, whether he comes in at eight years old or 18 years old. If he doesn't play for your first team, that's not a failure no. you, because you've developed them and improved them in all areas of life, whether that be in coaching and on the pitch but also in, you know, I worked in, in Aston Villa's academy and I used to 
stay for the the evening sessions to watch the young players and then you, sometimes you'd be teaching them how to use a knife and fork to cut their beans on toast on an evening that's part of a coach's job yep. in an academy yep. it's completely different to first team football yep. where it's results orientated Orientated. and that's the be all and end all is getting the three points on a Saturday afternoon academy is completely different and that's why we, we all love watching academy football because there's a positive in every minute of every game whether that be for your player or the opposition's player or something he does something he learns from because every mistake you make in an academy you learn from yeah you certainly do and also we're developing young young men for life because when you think about it realistically they spend so much time in in the academy system so we've got to make sure they, they're developed holistically. They've got their education on, on point. And they've, they understand about life. They've got a B plan. That if their A plan doesn't work out, they've, they've been set up with some form of education where they can go and step on and do higher education or, or go on to coaching or go on to something like that. I think they're the things that, for me personally, are really important for an academy. Mm-hmm. As Tommy said, people outside, they only see someone in the first team that's a successful academy. Someone not in the, in the first team is not successful. But... Me, I think there's more to it than, than just a success in the first team. The players are at the training ground or wherever they are for so many hours mm. during a week. You know, they, even, they come out of school now and come to do extra coaching. So I think it's, it, it's getting as much information as you can into the, into the players. And mm. essentially, you've got to make them realise this is a difficult Mm. profession to get yeah. in yes. whether that's a player a coach management or or even to to, to work in a, a social media team in a club everybody wants those those jobs you just got to work hard and, and, and try your best mm. you yeah. certainly have um, thank you very much for the question Barrage great question I've got a few more as well that we'll do a little bit later on in the show but thank you so much for getting involved this is what we want this show to be you to be part of it and you come inside the hive with us as well uh, of course here at the club we are celebrating Black History Month and we've listed our club's trailblazers and I'm delighted to say that one of those people on the list is one of our guests this evening, uh, the one named Mr. Girl, uh, Gifton Noel Williams. Um, Gifton, you've got some great names on that list that you accompany on that, the likes of Luther Blissett and John Barnes. Um, what does it mean to you to be on a list and celebrated like some of those great legends that have pulled on the Watford shirt? You know, I said a bit earlier that when you're playing, you don't really realise what you're doing and, and the impact you're making. And I always looked up to people like Paul Furlong, Bruce Dyer, who was playing in the first team when I was a youngster. So went up to me to be part of the Trailblazer, um, the, the, what, they, what they're trying to do. And actually going to, when I'm in, going to the academy and I see young people coming to talk to me and asking me questions, it makes me feel proud of, of my achievements, what I've done. And if there's a lot of people that helped me become who I was. Mm. So if me being who I am and me talking to youngsters and them seeing that Gifton made it when he was 16 and they can look at that and think, I can do that as well. If that's what that does, then I'm very happy for that reason. Mm, and we've got some footage of, of you playing. We've got some of uh, Luther in there as well. We can, we can have a little look at. But um, Black History Month, obviously, is incredibly important. And why is it so special to you? Um, I think as a month, I think if you talk about just for the month itself, I think it brings a lot of awareness to, to things, struggles, to, to great people that have lived in this country that we've never known of. Um, I think it brings awareness of, of a lot of things, you know, um, when it comes to the black culture, um, to black people, how we, be, how we came to England, what we've done in this country, the nurses, the doctors, the people that fought in the war. And I think it's just bringing a lot of, a lot of acknowledgement and education to people. I've learned a lot. Every Black History Month, I learn a lot, every single month. I think that a lot of TV programmes now, channels are doing a lot of good things to get a lot of awareness up. My personal thing is that it's a month, but it shouldn't just be a month. I think it should be a thing that a month is really good to bring a lot of awareness up. But I think it's what we do after that is very really important. So as long as people don't just see it as a month and then we can go back to our old old ways or just forget it. And people actually take the education that they've been given during the Black History Month and try and use it to educate themselves. I, I think it's really positive. No, massively. And I, I, I find it incredibly frustrating that we still have to have this racism discussion and when we still see it in everyday life. It's incredibly frustrating to see that. Um, but from your perspective, do, do you think we're making progress as a society from all the gestures of kneeling and everything we're doing in that education? Do you see an improvement? I think 100% I think we're making improvements. Um, <clears throat> I think before it was more in your face. Um, now it's more on social media behind someone with a phone in a closet, in a, in a little closet hiding. Um, I think for me personally, we made a lot of difference. A lot. I just talk about myself from a, a black male walking down the street, driving my car, living life. There's been so much improvements. I think people are more aware of things. Um, I can only talk about my own experiences that, and I'm, I'll, say it, I'll say it live on television, that my mother 
wasn't really too, too, she was racist. Or I'll say she had a mindset of, she didn't really like a lot of white people when I was growing up. And I had a good friend called Jamie Kinsella. He was white and he came to my house a couple of times to sneak him in. And he came to my house and my mum my caught him one day. And she caught him, she cooked dinner for him. He ate all the dinner up. She was amazed. She gave him more dinner. He ate it up again. And almost every single day he came around my house. And it kind of blend, helped my mum understand that it's not about colour, it's about the person, if that makes sense. Where yeah. her experience of living in England before that, a lot of white people was almost mean to her a little bit. So she just assumed that all white people was bad. And I'm saying that because I think education is the key. So my mum was a bit racist, my family was, but my brothers and sisters, my cousins, we grew up with white, black, Indian, Asians, every, all kind of races. So we're not racist at all. And I think the same goes the other way around. If you look at England 100 years ago, there wasn't a lot of black people here. There wasn't a lot of other colours here. So people have to take time to understand that through education and through generations, we're, we're bridging the generation gap. Because I know that I had a lot of friends that their parents was a bit racist, but my friends were not racist. Their kids are not racist. And so as, as time goes on, I think racism will thin out mm. through people knowing each other's cultures, through people being open with each other, um, through awareness. And I, I think it will thin out myself. I think you're always going to have the people that hate. <laughs> you're yeah. always going to have the people that go on social media. You're always going to have the people that say things behind people's back. That's just life, you know. I don't think it will ever disappear. And would it really disappear? No, it's not ever going to disappear. But I feel that we are going in the right way. Um, players taking a knee, more awareness. Famous people talking about it, more awareness. I think having allies, like my fellow allies, my fellow people that who are not black talking about it, yeah. is so powerful. Because then it's not me having a chip on my shoulder, because you ain't got no chip on your shoulder, but when you're saying something is wrong, then people will listen to you. Now, if I say the same thing, and Tommy's saying the same thing, they might listen to me a bit more, yeah. if that kind of makes sense. So I think education, I think education is the key in living with each other and being around each other. Because um, when you do that, it brings understanding. 100%. 100%. Couldn't agree with you more on that one. And Tommy, I guess, you know, things like Black History Month, they're an opportunity for us all to learn as well. And, and obviously, playing a team like you have with players from lots of different cultures and backgrounds, that education has been so key. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, it, it's something that I, I can, I've never experienced, I never will experience. So uh, sometimes I, I'd rather listen to Gifton talk about it because I know he's experienced it, he's, he's walked in those shoes. And, and I think it, the, the key to it is that everybody stands up for, for, for what they believe is, is, is right. And I, it's, sometimes I just think it's a shame, and I've said it before, it's a shame that sometimes with football, people on the terraces don't behave like the people in the dressing room. Yeah, yeah. Because there was no, there wasn't, you, you weren't picked because of the colour of your skin, you weren't celebrated when you scored because of the colour of your skin, you were a footballer, there was no relevance to your colour of a skin yeah. within a dressing room. Yeah. And I just wish that, that that spread around the stadiums. No, 100%. And uh, we're incredibly proud here at Watford to be supporting Black History Month and definitely making sure we kick out racism. And if uh, you are ever in a situation when you hear it, make sure you report it and kick it out because it has no place in our game. Now, uh, talking about Black History Month, we can keep celebrating that right now because uh, William Truce de Kong has been speaking to us and telling us about one of his trailblazers. One that's more personal to you, I'd imagine, and, and some that's within football as well, Stephen Keshi former manager of Nigeria and, and Togo as well, and a very successful player. What, what did he mean to you and, and as a person, how much did he help you as well? Yeah, so Stephen Keshi is someone uh, close to my heart. Uh, he was uh, my first uh, manager of the Super Eagles. I made my debut under him and then uh, sadly a few months later he passed away, uh, which was quite shocking at the time. Um, and also being a, a central defender, he was a, a player that I grew up watching and looking up to. He won the AFCON as a player and as a manager, um, had success with Togo as well. And, and he was just a general, very loving and caring person. So um, yeah, it's sometimes difficult to come across um, uh, people in the football industry that you can really relate to, have a connection with. Um, but from the first time he called me up to ask me to be part of his team, uh, when I was 21, I think, or 22, it was already something special that I spoke on the phone to a legend. And then a few months later when I met him and he actually put me in the team to make my debut, it was, uh, yeah, it was unbelievable. So I feel indebted to him uh, for the rest of my life. And um, yeah, I feel like I didn't have a chance really to say thank you to him for, for that moment because um, he passed so suddenly. So yeah, like I said, someone very close to my heart and um, yeah, an idol for me on and off the pitch. 
Great to hear from William Troost uh, Kong there with his trailblazer as we celebrate Black History Month. Uh, you're watching Inside the Hive. Thank you so much for joining us here on our first show. We're going to be live every Thursday, 7 till 8, giving you some great inside, some exclusives. We're going to be talking about the first team, the women's team, the academy team. Uh, so hopefully you're enjoying it. We want to get you involved as well. So thank you so much for your questions so far. Keep those coming in and we'll get you involved more and more as the weeks continue. Uh, as we've mentioned already on the show tonight, the women's team there are in action on Sunday against Crystal Palace in the FA Women's Championship. Kickoff is 2 p.m. Come down and support the women's team. Tickets.watfordfc.com. And it's a busy weekend as well because, of course, the men are at home as well on Saturday. Three o'clock kickoff in the Premier League. They take on Southampton. Once again, tickets.watfordfc.com. Calm. Now, we're going to look forward to that Southampton game very shortly, but we can't not reflect on the fantastic result last weekend. Um, Tommy, 5-2 victory over Everton. What a game. It was a fabulous, fabulous result, uh, performance and atmosphere. It was my first away game for 18 months that I'd ever been to doing the commentary with John Marks and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Even the 60 mile an hour zone on the M6 with all of the Watford fans with the scarves hanging out the windows that I could, just couldn't get away from because I was sat at 60. So it was a thoroughly enjoyable day. I really enjoyed it. This could be a new game if you're travelling to an away game and you're a passenger. Obviously, if you're not a driver, but if you're a passenger and you see Tommy, we want pictures. Send them in of Tommy, Tommy on the road. Um, and Gifton, you know, so important. Obviously, disappointment after that, that kind of Liverpool game. But, you know, we saw what Manchester United did this weekend. So there's obviously no shame in that. But really important to get that first win under the belt for the manager. Yeah, I think when a new regime comes in, to get the first three points is very, very important. Um, if you be realistic, to get the win against the game against Liverpool was going to be a lost game anyway, wasn't it, realistically? And whether it was a tight game and we've done really well, but losing 5-0 it seemed harsh at the time. But as we know, Liverpool can do that to anyone on their day. So um, this game was, was absolutely wonderful. Getting the, the three points, I'm sure the manager would have been happy. He's scoring five goals himself. Would have been a big blow, a big, um, big plus for the team. Josh King getting a hat trick, I think, is is massive. You know, for his confidence, he's worked so hard this season, and, and for him to get some reward, I think, will be massive for him to kick on now and to start bossing defenses around. Mm, yeah, it's Tommy all about was... the, re the reaction yeah. from a five 0 defeat, mm -hmm. and they certainly got that from the first minute. We look look to get the ball forward, put the ball in the channels. The front three. I mean, Gifton and I, have, we know how tough it is. We both played that nine role on our own at spells. Um, and that's a tough role and we've both sung the praises uh, of Josh King so delighted that he's got not just uh, on the score sheet but a hat-trick and really top top draw yeah. finishes but as well composure yeah. in front of goal that's not easy to do particularly when you're away from home and certainly you know when you've only just scored your first goal of the season with a tap in and then it almost went was taken away with the VAR decision so I just thought it was a, an excellent attacking performance there's areas we can improve but you always can yeah. if you if you leave in Liverpool winning 5-0 there's areas they can areas they can improve in their game yeah. we can do that too and it just sets up a massive game now against Southampton at the weekend I think the scoring goals as well is so important in the Premier League I think if you can score goals in the Premier League you'll win games you'll win enough games I think that's one of the hardest things keeping a clean sheet in the Premier League is quite hard but scoring goals are fine, especially for teams who just come up. It normally is very hard because they don't have that attacking purpose. They don't have those players. But you look at the front three or even the four, the five. If you talk about the guys on the bench uh, that Watford have, um, if we sit back and then we really go with speed, the, the pace we've got, the, the, the effort and the drive we've got with those guys up front, I think we'll score goals this year. Yeah, we're playing it. We're in, back in the Premier League. We're playing against the best players in the world. Yeah. You know, you, with Ronaldo coming back to United, there's only Messi left to come now. So you, you've got Salah, you've got, uh, and you've got um, Ronaldo. Yeah. So it, it, it's really difficult. And I completely agree with Gifton. Keeping clean sheets is a very, very tough ask in the Premier League, particularly for a club the size of, of Watford, Watford yeah. but, but for, for anybody. Um, so we've got to go and score goals, and we certainly did that comfortably on Saturday. Interesting stat from the game. Um, that was Watford's first ever win at Goodison Park in the club's history. So it got me guys thinking, um, you guys, was ever a ground that you went to that you just couldn't get a victory at? I think mine is Sunderland. <laughs> I, I think, I don't think I've ever won there. I think with Roker Park, Stadium of Light, I don't think I've ever, ever single won. Not one time have I won there. I, I've never won at Sunderland either. There must <laughs> be something get. about Sunderland. <laughs> Sunderland. But, no, I think you, are, you always get grounds, don't you? That, that Players always have the ones that Mm. I would always think, right, I'm going to score. I always score at this, yes. this, this stadium. And, and you have games where you know you're playing against top teams. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you almost dread going there. But 
I'm not sure. one for me, Wolves. I didn't like playing at Wolves. I didn't like playing at Wolves. Just I, I don't like the colour of the kit. But <laughs> <laughs> obviously, so I'm for Birmingham. I always scored at Molyneux. It was one of those grounds for me, yeah. It never. I, don't feel like, I did score at Wolves against um, when I was at Stoke. But it was always one of them grounds where I just, just didn't like playing there. I don't know why, I don't know what it was, I just didn't really like playing there, I don't know why. Maybe because it's too far up north, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's just too cold for <laughs> too you. Too cold up there, that's why. <laughs> it's south of Stoke though, aren't you? <laughs> you must say, you're, you're right. <laughs> it's Stoke wore gloves on the side, so it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Time for a couple more questions that have come in. So thank you so much uh, for you if you've put a question in tonight. Um, obviously, we've seen a couple of games now under Claudio Ranieri. Um, Charlotte Gibson says, we'll be interested to know uh, Gifton and Tommy's thoughts on how Ranieri will approach the head coach role at Watford. How do you see him playing? Is he going to go for the defensive approach or is he going to go more counter-attacking or is he going to go all-out attack? What do you boys think? We've, we've, we've discussed this for an hour pre-show. <laughs> pre -show. It's so we haven't got an hour. The way, <laughs> the, the way they do it. I think it, he, he, he's been a counter-attacking manager. With his success at, at Leicester and everywhere he's been, he's, he's been a counter-attacking manager. And I think that the, the current squad is, is set up to do very similar to that. And a, a, again, another point that, that Gifton's already mentioned, but if we score more goals than we concede, we'll, we'll achieve Premiership status yeah. next season it's as simple as that so I think he'll want to score goals as opposed to yes he'll want to tighten up at the back but I think the more important is that we we counter-attack quickly and with pace and, and and with real quality and create opportunities to score goals and I think you might see a lot of um, similarities from the Leicester team to the Watford team as if you look at the front three the Leicester team back then you had Albrighton you had Vardy and you had Mahrez now, if you look at our front three, they're all quick, they're all effective, they, they will get at people. And if you get them the ball very early, I think they can go and be dangerous. Um, if, we can, if we can show it up the defence and make sure that we get, I'm, I'm sure he'll get the two holding mid players to really sit in front of the defence and, and, and keep that solid. And I think if he does that with the players that they've got, I think we can, we'll score goals. Mm. Obviously, when you're a new manager coming in mid-season, it's always quite difficult because you haven't got that time to prepare in a pre-season. Um, January will be a chance for him to have a look at his squad and decide what he wants to do. And, and Ian Crute sent a question in. Ian, thank you very much for that. He says, does the panel think that there'll be much investment and in signings in January? Because, um, of course, you've got the African Ch Nations Championship happening as well in that kind of January times. So players from across the Premier League disappearing. Um, how do you think that will affect maybe selections on who comes in or covering different positions? I think it's... It because um, Claudio Ranieri has come in at a stage where he's got to work with the squad he's got for essentially three months, mm, yep. and then he can he can make additions and players will come in and go out. Notoriously in Jan January, it's a, it's a quiet window. Yes, it's always going to be there, but it's a quiet window. Nobody ever really spends big or, or, or makes their main signing from a season in January. I think it's just adding to the squad and he certainly have plenty of time to look at what he needs and I'm sure that the recruitment department are, 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 are scouting Europe and the world already for the things that, that Ranieri says that he's going to need come January so I think it's one of those is, is, it's going to be an important window certainly for us and like you say it, it, with the, the African nations that's going to affect every club yeah. some more than us yeah. arguably so it, it, it might well be ironically an advantage yep. um, for, for several teams yeah. in the Premier League. So it'll be interesting to see how it develops. And just quickly, if there was one position each you think that we might need to look at that where we could bring someone in? I'll say centre-back. I'll say centre-back if, if we had a, a real domineering centre-back, someone who we know is, is a dominating uh, centre-back there. We've got some really good centre-backs, really, really good centre-backs. Um, but when I look at them, I don't personally see anyone who is a premiership dominating centre back. But can we bring a player like that in, in January? I don't know. But one thing I do know is that over the years the the, the owners, the, the owners, the the, the the people that are in charge, they've been very shrewd with their people they've brought in and they're signing. So I'm sure there's a dominant centre back out there somewhere in Europe playing that we've never heard of or we don't know about but and they're looking at. So I think they will try and improve in a centre back or in the full back areas. I agree. I think de defensively, I think it, it'll be interesting to see how Nkulu adapts to the Premier League. I, I watched him many years ago at Marseille, and he stood out in a in a real star-studded Marseille team at that that time. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how he adapts. He might well be that that domineering centre back, um, but 
defensively certainly the areas I mean we brought in a lot of midfielders and we're a lot of forwards mm -hmm. in the summer window so for me defensively um, and some strength in the goalkeeper department okay we'll see what happens with that um the fixture gods have been kind to us in November because uh, we've got some big games on the way. Arsenal, Man United, Leicester, Chelsea and then we kick off December with that Chelsea game and, and Man City in there as well. But it's Southampton this weekend. Um, how important is it to get a good result this weekend, Gifton? Yeah, in the Premiership, it's always important to get three points. Um, I think Southampton is a winnable game. It's a game that if we go and attack it with the players that we've got, I think we can play on the front foot and go and attack them and really take it to them. And, but even if you look at the other fixtures, um, for me, for a club like Watford, I would actually be striving, looking for those fixtures, because I think they're, with the style of football that I think the, the manager will play, I think it actually kind of suits to play against some of these teams. Let them have the ball a little bit and let's surprise them on the break. So it actually might be good for him to get in his, his philosophy, what he's trying to do with them, because he's playing against such high teams. But for, for this weekend, I think that's three points in the bag for us. Yeah, massively. And um, what kind of threats will Southampton pose, Tommy, for Watford this weekend? I think it's, it's similar to us. They have a lot of pace in, in attack. Um, I think it's they've only lost three games, but they've drawn five, I think, and won one game. So they're not exactly in good form, but they're not playing as the other teams that are towards the bottom of the, of the league have lost a lot more than three games. So I think it's one of those where they're not far away from from being where the, the, the head coach wants them to be. So I think it's one that we have to be careful with. I, having said that, we're at home at Vicarage Road on the back of a great win at Everton. Mm -hmm. Uh, we know the lads will be desperate for three o'clock Saturday afternoon to come and show the home fans what they showed the away fans on Saturday. And if we get that again, I don't see any problems. Mm. Statistically, there's been a lot of draws in there. If you saw the tweets that went out a little bit earlier on in the club's official uh, Twitter feed with the stats on that. Uh, boys, finally, I'm just going to push you for a score prediction for the weekend. 3-1. Uh, 3-1. Them... You didn't waste much time there, no, did you? 3-1. <laughs> I'm going 3-1. Awesome. <laughs> Perfect. Um, Tommy Gifton, thank you so much for joining us uh, on the first uh, Inside the Hive. Pleasure to have your company. We could have spoken for another hour, another two hours at least, I think. It's been absolutely fantastic to have you with us. So thank you for joining us. Thank you very much to you for watching as well, the first Inside the Hive. We are going to be with you every Thursday, 7 till 8. Thank you so much to all of you who sent questions in this weekend, of course. Get involved uh, next week as well. Have a great rest of your week. Enjoy the game on Saturday. Enjoy the game on Sunday if you're coming to support the women's team as well. And we will see you live for Inside the Hive next Thursday, 7 till 8.